All right, in this first lesson on beam deflections, we're going to set a little bit of context, but most importantly, we're going to uh, d develop the model that we're going to use to try to estimate uh, beam deflections. So we'll get into in a little bit about the difference between deflections, deformations, and displacements. Uh, for beams, that distinction is maybe not as strong as it might be um, for other types of displacements and deformations. All right, so we're here in Chapter 10 of Philpot or a related um, chapter if you are in a different textbook. But the big thing here is that in statics, we develop the first part of our family of beam equations. Now, some textbooks will use the distributed load intensity symbol to be W. Some will use Q. Those are the two most common symbols. Some will define the positive direction up. Some will define it as down. We're going to define it as positive Q is upwards. Right? And that the first derivative of the shear is equal to the load intensity. Right? So capital V, we're now going to become very soon case sensitive here. Shear as a function of X is capital V. Moment as a function of X is capital M. First derivative or the slope of the moment diagram is equal to the shear. That means the second derivative of the moment is equal to the distributed load intensity. Right? Then we also, in a previous <coughs> module, derived the moment curvature relationship, m equals ei kappa. And then just straight from calculus, if our deflection expression, lowercase v, sometimes people will use uh, lowercase y for this, but lowercase v, then the first derivative of that would be the slope. And because of small angle theory, then tangent of theta is approximately equal to theta. And of course, tangent of theta is the first derivative there. So that's why you see this symbol for slope, theta equals d little v dx. And the second derivative, again, small angle theory, the curvature is approximately equal to the second derivative of little v with respect to x, that's our kappa. Right? So when we pull all of that together, then note that the moment is equal to ei times the second derivative of little v. But since the second derivative of the moment is equal to the load, we can marry all this together into one governing differential equation, which is as follows. Right, and this is a big, long mouthful. And if you are a typical beam out there in real life, then t usually, but not always, ridges being sometimes an exception, but typically EI is a constant in our models with respect to X. And when that is the case, of course, EI pops right on out. We don't have to use the chain rule anymore. We've got EI times then the fourth derivative of our deflection is equal to our load. And that then becomes our governing differential equation for beam deflections. Right now, four derivatives, but note where four derivatives come from. Two of them from beam kinematics. That means things like displacement and slope or rotation. And then two of them associated with beam static. So when we have this fourth order differential equation, the only way we can solve for that completely and uniquely for a given situation is to have two force related boundary conditions and two displacement related boundary conditions. Only for a total of four. All right, so let's take a look at what that might be all about here. All right? And the, the keys, as we think about this, these boundary conditions are going to be associated with connections, ends of, ends of the beam maybe, the support conditions. And it's all going to be about what displacements are constrained or what displacements are restrained. That'll be the key every single time, right? So rotations or slopes, right? Theta rotations are associated 
with bending moment and transverse displacements or translations perpendicular to the longitudinal axis are associated with shear. All right, so let's take a look at what we've got here. Here is a beam that frames into a column and notice a critical thing here. You've got the flanges of this connection are, or rather flanges of the beam are directly attached to this end plate. Right, and this end plate then is connected right where the flanges connect, right there at to the column. Right? So remember that the bending moment is predominantly carried where the stresses are highest and that's going to be in the flanges. Right? Sigma equals my over i, y is the distance away from the neutral axis, hence why some people don't like to use y for the symbol for the transverse displacement. This is a distance away from the neutral axis. Right? And, oh, well, sigma max happens out at the outer fiber. So if we connect it up, we can transfer moment through this connection. And whatever is the rotation of this end of the beam, that will also be the rotation of the column. But that means that in this case, oh, moment predominantly carried in the flanges, the flanges and, in this case, the web are connected. So that means we're transferring both moment and shear. This is a rigid or a fixed connection, not support, but connection. Right? That's kind of a key thing. It's all about, in this case, are the flanges of this thing connected in the outer edges? Whereas we look down here at this next one, we've got beams that are framed in, and notice only the webs are connected. That's true of all three of these beam connections, beam to beam, and this beam to the column, and this other one beam to col column. Web only connection. That means shear transfer only. Shear transfer only. So that means that the moment will end up being zero in this connection because this thing is allowed to, in a sense, act like A hinge or an internal pin. Right? It can transfer <coughs> shear and axial only. I already said shear transfer only, but transfer shear and axial. Right? And all this is um, all to say that we have translational compatibility. in terms of the displacements. What does that mean? It means that if the end of this beam were to go up and down or sideways, that's going to have to be exactly what happens in terms of displacements with the supporting member, this other beam. But it can rotate and that rotation won't translate over, in this case, to a torsion on that particular supporting beam. Same thing over here, if the beam wants to go up and down, well the column is going to have to go up and down or sideways along with that, but the end of the beam can rotate without also causing the column to rotate. Unlike what we had up here, that if this beam wants to rotate, then the end of the column will have to rotate because this is a rigid. So we go back here, you could say, well, maybe the keys aren't what displacements are constrained and what rotations or what displacements are restrained. It's a what kind of forces can be transferred. Well, that's going to go directly hand in hand here. If we allow for a rotation to happen that's not continuous, then the moment's going to be zero because there will be nothing to prevent that. Right? So let's look at this um, in another video segment here in terms of these displacement boundary conditions that go along with beam connections and supports.